have had some extremely good worship. Y'all so excited you didn't even let me finish my sentence. I was trying to say something and they just said, yes, sir. Uh, those uh, gifted gentlemen who are running the sound, I need plenty of bass. Some of you know I preach with diseased lungs. That's not funny. I'm a walking miracle. At age 29, Having had lung surgery for boli emphysema, the rarest form of emphysema, the doctor said to me that if I wanted to live to see my 40th birthday, I should give up preaching. over 50 years ago. We serve a mighty God. Now, Dr. Jules, and your lovely wife, officers and leaders of this outstanding field, the dignitaries from the union office, uh, fellow preachers like old Jones sitting out there. <laughs> Nixon and these other fellows, they were stu some of these guys were students at Oakwood when I taught there. You know, you wonder if they're going to turn out to be anything at all. Now here he is, president of one of the largest conferences in the world. What a mighty God we serve. I love these fellas. I love these fellas. And I'm glad to be here. The last time I preached at this camp meeting, to show you how long it's been, um, George Earl was your president. <laughs> so I guess you didn't like anything I said that day. <laughs> Lord moved upon Jules, said, bring the old man back. <laughs> Give him another crack at it. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I was at Southwest camp meeting with Bird. Carlton Bird. It's strange to travel and preach now without my beloved wife sitting in the congregation. Just give me a moment, I'll be okay. We've ministered together for 55 years. And when I would stand up, she would bow her head. I knew that. But the Lord has kept me here for yet a purpose. But I am glad to be here, and I really appreciate this. I really do, this invitation uh, to come put me in the and the care of Easton Marks. I've come to love this guy. We've taught, we've settled all the problems in the world in two days. <laughs> Driving and talking, we figured it all out. You give me and Marks a shot at it, we'll fix everything.
Dr. Spence, a pleasure, sir. They've allowed me the humble task of teaching homiletics at the institution that he leads out in. And I think we last did camp meeting together in Bermuda, didn't we? Yes, good to see you here. Well, enough of this foolishness. Let's, uh, you know how we preachers do. We get up, we wander around. You're saying, why don't the Negro preach? He's, Well, I'm 80. See, I'm 80. You take a big chance to invite an 80-year-old man to preach. We can't keep our minds on nothing for about five minutes. That's why I have notes. <laughs> Let's pray, Father, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. Amen. I do a lot of reading. And these quotes from the book Great Controversy have restirred my soul. I'm going to take my time. Everybody else did. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Patriarchs and prophets. But a scene yet darker is presented in the revelations of the future. Listen to this. The records of the past, the long processions of tumults, conflicts, and revolutions. Oh, the old lady writes, the battle of the warrior with confused and garments rolled in blood. What are these in contrast with the terrors of the day? Now, here comes the phrase. Here comes the phrase that has stirred up the old preacher. What are these in contrast to the terrors of the day when the restraining spirit of God shall be holy? Lord, help me. Withdrawn from the wicked. No longer holding in check the outbursts of human passion and satanic wrath. Are you then still amazed at the carnage and the brutality? People shooting people. Big nations swallowing up small nations. Are you in shock? Have you not read? Do you? Calm down, Henry. Do you not understand? Lord, help me. The old man wants to preach, but I got to go slow at first. <laughs> Lord, help me. Do you not understand that you would not have sanity in your brain without the presence of the Holy Ghost? You could not think yourself through a day. You could not get through the streets of New York or Boston or wherever you come from unless God's spirit was holding the reins of your brain. Because there is a power, there is a force, there is a darkness and a wickedness that abides on the planet. And the only restraining force is the Holy Spirit of God. The old lady writes about it. But I'm still reading the Spirit of God. Now she gets personal. Persistently resisted. See, not only does he maintain your sanity, 
Oh, what singing you let us in, my brother. When you got that, 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 that hymn, Watch Ye Saints, you got all down inside of me. Woo! The Spirit of God persistently resisted has at last been withdrawn. And Satan will plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one final great trouble. This was written over a hundred years ago, Dr. Jones as the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be set loose. Are we there? You know we are. And so with this somber context, I read my key text, Isaiah 6, Verses 8 and 9. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? See, in these times. We read about the times. Crazy world, but the Bible asks the question. Who will go? You stirred me up. But that subject, that theme, who's going to go? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, come on, y'all. Let me read my text by myself. Here am I. Send me. My subject, go as you are. See, one of the keys to Bible study, Bible reading, and the interpretation of Scripture is to give constant attention to context. We teach them that, Jones. Pay attention not to just what the text says, but where is the text located in the saying? Contextual preaching is the only sermon worth hearing. Every text of scripture has a setting. Any conclusion about what the text means cannot be accurate unless you ask some questions such as, who said it? To whom was it said? Why, when, and where was it said? But you must go further than that. You must look at what comes before the text. That will be critical in our presentation today. What comes after the passage? Who's the author of the text? Does the writer have any of the books where he discusses the same subject? Is the passage under consideration? appear in the Old or the New Testament. That is very key to understanding a passage. Are the meanings I'm deriving from the text, watch me now, consistent with the Bible teachings as a whole. Don't yank a text all by itself out and try to find truth. You got to make sure your decision about that text is consistent with all the other texts in the Bible. And then finally, is this text consistent with all the things that particular writer has said? Is it prophecy? Is it poetry? Is it a story? These considerations are critical. I'm setting you up now. I always teach before I preach. These considerations are critical for the serious Bible student for the Bible says, study to show thyself how? Approved unto God, not ignorant unto God, approved unto God. And then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you know it by heart, all scripture is given by inspiration of God so we can be thoroughly equipped, the end of the text says. This is very important. 
in these final days. If you're going to go as you are, you need to know what you're talking about. It's going to shock you to find out just whom God sent. We, we love this thing we call the Great Commission. 28. I know you can quote it, but don't show off. Just take your Bible, your phone, and so the ignorant folk around you won't feel bad. Find the text. This is Jesus talking now. I'm getting ready to get into it. Getting ready to get into it. This is Jesus talking. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do what? Observe everything, everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You know, this same commission appears in three other books. Mark, Luke, and John. And each writer, each writer, remembering the same moment with Jesus, when he commissioned them, each writer has a different version of the commission. And each writer's version, my dear young lady, is influenced by that writer's experience with Jesus. Matthew tells it one way, Mark another, Luke who was not there and got it from the eyewitnesses, Luke 1 verse 3, and John who was there, all depending upon their relationship with God and with the Savior, reveals what they remember about the Great Commission. My subject is go as you are. Go as you are. Ellen White talking about this says, texts written in different ages by different men who differed widely in rank and occupation. The books of the Bible contrast in style as presented through different individuals, the truth is bought in its various aspects. One writer is more strongly impressed with one phase of the subject. And you're going to find this as I go through these four books. Each commission record is influenced by the mindset of the rememberer. Matthew, the Levite, some believe Levite, he was a son of a priest, a PK. Peter, Ellen White, and others agree. Uh, Mark, rather, are the, are, are the memories of Peter. And you'll see what Peter told Mark, what he remembered. And then Luke, who got it from the eyewitnesses. And then John, who laid on his breast. Each gives us a version of this great commission. <sighs> Go back to Matthew 28, because you missed something when you read it. You did what I told you. You read verses 19 and 20. Stay with me now. But look at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appeared unto them. And they, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some, some, say it, some, he, He just commissioned in Matthew 28 11 men with doubts. Uh, 
Go as you are. <laughs> you don't need a PhD. You don't need to understand Greek and Hebrew. Even if you got some doubts and some questions about what's going on in the church, uh, about what's going on in the conference, about God's care, uh, they were left on their own and uh, Jesus left them there to struggle. If you got doubts about Christ, how he's dealing with you, doubts about God, how he's acting, doc got doubts about the church, how it's going, get on up with your doubts and go because, because as you go with your doubts, as you let the gospel pour through your sick soul, the gospel will purge you of your doubts. You'll find strength in telling, strength in going, strength in witnessing. Don't sit there and doubt. Get up off of your and go. You thought those apostles were perfect. You thought those apostles believed. But Jesus looked at them and said, their minds are all messed up. They don't understand all that's going on. But I need them to go like they are. Don't wait until all the problems are solved. Go. Get up out of your pew and go. That changed the whole context of the going. You see, I thought I had to be somebody. Just go. I thought I had to be head deacon. Just go. I thought I needed to be at least an elder. Just go. I thought I needed to sing in the choir. You can't sing. Just go. We keep waiting on some big miracle. And so when the president and the brethren stand up and say, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. We say, well, you know, I, I, I have some things about the Bible I don't understand. There's some things about the Bible I don't understand. You ain't saying nothing. You got to go. And it comes from a PK. Matthew the Levite who grew up in the church but when Jesus found him he was out selling for the Romans he was a taxpayer he lost his way he stopped going to Sabbath school he was missing at church and Jesus found him counting his money and said I need you to come, son. I got something for you to do, son. But Jesus, I got doubts. I know you got doubts. Get on out there and do what I tell you to do. Get on out there and tell somebody how good God is. And while you're telling them, you're fine. Your doubts will disappear. But go. Well, Peter remembers it a different way. Mark 16. I'm not going to be up long, but I'll be up long enough. Mark 16, verse 12. Now, this thing is pitiful. Here it is. This is Peter. Remember who's... Remember this is Peter. And you remember Peter's problem. You know, just before, the night before. Let me review it for you because some of y'all don't read nothing. The night, the night before. Yeah, the night before. He was crucified. He said to Peter, tonight you're going to deny me thrice. We say three, but Jesus said thrice. Peter said, Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. You got the wrong fella here. I'll die first. Jesus was just as calm. He said, no. <laughs> Before breakfast in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And then, you know, in the, in the Greek Bible, there's no, there's no chapter. 
division. There's no text division. It just goes one from the other. And the words I just shared with you are in uh, 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 um, John 13. John 13. Toward the end, that's when Jesus, and, and, and he blows him out in front of the church. All the other disciples are standing there. So Peter gets defensive. No! Because the other disciples are looking, what, 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 what? What did he say? Peter, Peter was the big shot. He's telling Peter, what? Peter said, no, 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 no. And so, John 14, 1, we call it, but the next verse says, let not your heart be troubled. See, those words were spoken to Peter, whom he had just embarrassed. Are y'all listening to me? It goes on to say, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Even, even though I know you're going to mess up tonight, I'm already working on your mansion. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I know you're going to deny me. I know you're going to lie, but that's all right. I got so much faith in the power of the Holy Ghost down in your life. I'm going to set a place for you right on Hallelujah Street in the Golden City. I'm working on it right now. Don't be troubled, Peter. You're going to be all right. Now, none of that is in my sermon notes. That's just extra stuff that I stuck in there. But, 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 let me finish this. I told you about old preachers. We're a mess. Yeah, here we go. Uh, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as he walked into the country and then went and told it to the rest. Now, verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and, re and rebuked, watch it now, he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he died. Then comes the commission. Go into all the world and preach. He says to these hard-hearted Negroes, these hard-hearted Jews, Forgive me, Elder. He says to these hard-hearted people, go. See, the subject of my sermon is go as you are. See, you've been in the church so long, you've gotten hard-hearted. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you want to go to hell, spend a lot of time around church people. Did I say it? Did you hear me say that? I put it in my sermon. You see, I'm, listen to me. I'm convinced that the reason why the church is packed with folks is to get me ready for the kingdom. Because every kind of person you ever heard of that ain't got no sense that as crazy as a bed bug is in the church. And if you can stay in the church with them, you know there's a place for you in the glory. Yeah, he doesn't stop preaching now and gone to meddling. There are people in the church that will drive nuts. When you hear the voice on the phone, you cry, oh Lord have mercy. Yeah, I'm enjoying this part of the sermon. And Jesus said to these hard-hearted people, because they spent three and a half years with each other, sometimes the apostles did not get along, sometimes they did not agree. But you see, God has placed us in this situation to season us, to let us know that he's able to work. And by the way, by the way, as I'm talking about rough folk in the church, you need to be looking in the mirror.
just in case you thought you were not included. See the whole, see the whole, see the folk, I, I've been preaching it for 50 some years. The church is a hospital. No, no, no. That's not right. That's not fair. It's not fair. The church is an insane asylum. Now I got it right this time. And that's why you have no business talking about anybody in the church. We're all sick. We're messed up, jacked up, tore up. And don't you dare, next Sabbath, next Sabbath when the, when the pastor preaches, don't you dare get up and say, he sure told them. You say, he sure told me. What I love about Jesus is that the church does not scare him away. He loves us. He believes in us. And that's why when you get to glory, you're going to say, hey, look who's here. And then you're going to turn and see a reflection in the golden walls. And you're going to say, hey, I'm here. Glory. Hallelujah. He told them, go. He knew, brother, that if they worked for the church, in the church, they'd be softened. Because as you go out and you meet other people who are messed up and jacked up just like you, and you see them respond to the gospel as you did, then it purifies you of that hardness. It cleanses you of that judgmental spirit. It allows you to recognize that the lady who comes to church with five kids, with five different last names, has just got as much place in God's house as you have. Thank God for that young person who still has the courage to come to church with their jewelry on. Thank God for that woman who comes to church with that split up her thigh. Thank God for the man who still comes to church with tobacco on his breath. Thank God that we have not run them away from Jesus. And they believe by the power of God that they can be different. So he says to them hard-hearted apostles, go. You got doubts, go. Your heart is hard, go. I'm in Luke now. I'm in Luke now. Now Luke was not there when the commission was given. He wasn't there. Uh, we're not even sure where they had joined the church yet. But later on when he was baptized, some believe that it was Stephen who brought Luke into the church, the deacon Stephen. Luke yearned to have known Jesus personally. He heard the stories and was just deeply impressed by how Jesus affected people. And the thing that moved him most was the fact that Jesus was not, he was not to partial. He would heal uh, the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, he would hang around with, with the harlots and, 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 and the tax gatherers. Uh, and said, Luke said, well, now he was a Gentile, you know. He said, well, this Jesus is there. He's not, he's not a Jew like the rest of the Jews. I want to know about him. And so he tells us that he went to the eyewitnesses, verse 2, to get his information. And here's what he recalls about the Great Commission. Luke 24. Luke 24. Man, this thing really bothers me. Luke 24, 44 through 49. This is sad, folk. And he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written by the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now verse 45 just leaves me embarrassed because 
my good friend East Indies are the leaders of the church that he's talking to. These are the first official evangelists. <laughs> Verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Now they've been in school with him for three and a half years. Did, did you see that my brother? He's about to go back to heaven. And after three and a half years, see folk, this is why we're gonna shout for a million years in heaven even before we get to our mansion. You know, time will be of no essence. Talk about praise service, brother. <laughs> and, and, and after all this time, they're sitting there looking at him and they still don't understand he's a fulfillment of the prophecies. And he said in verse 36, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary. You see, they were also, besides being hard-hearted and being in doubt, they were ignorant, I mean ignorant. <laughs> now, let me encourage you. See, some of you won't go witness because you say, see, I don't, I don't understand the Bible like deacon so-and-so. Now, number one, you're not deacon so-and-so. See, this, this is why I get, I get very disturbed you know, when folk compare preachers. It bothers me. Now, it doesn't bother me because I care where you rate me. Because I don't care where you rate me. I care where he rates me. But my point is, my point is, here's my point, making a point. point is, this thing we do about comparing And some of you have never gone out and witnessed. Here's your president getting ready to preach a crusade. He talked about crusades already going to have taken place. Did you take anybody? Did you sit next to someone in the meeting and open your Bible and help them find the text? So we got to stop playing games here. No, you're not a Bible scholar, sis. That's all right. You know John 3, 16. Come on now. Share that. Now, I was reared in a very deep Adventist background. At age nine, uh, Dr. Spence, I could explain the 2300 days without a Bible. My grandfather, first black Seventh-day Adventist in Dayton, Ohio. Learned the truth by reading Bible readings for the home. Some of y'all don't even know what that book is. But some of you just came in the church recently. And, and you don't know much. But you know Jesus saves. Since you know Jesus saves, I saw you up there singing your heart out. You know Jesus saves. Tell somebody how he saved you. You don't need a Bible and a dictionary and concordance and, and, and Bible encyclopedia. Just get on up and tell them how 2,300 days? No, you can't explain that. But you know, for 23 days, he kept you in food and clothing and water and tell somebody what God has done. You don't need a long lecture. You don't need to preach 24 sermons in four weeks. That's for the preacher. You can just tell somebody this week God kept me when I thought the car was going to hit me. God kept me when I was ready to knock my husband blind. God kept me when my kids were acting like me and I wanted to kill them. God kept me. Tell them what you know. Tell them what God has done. You don't need a long lecture. God 
God. Tell them about God. Go as you are. Go with your doubts. <laughs> Go with your hard heart. Go with your ignorance. What we need now, Mr. President, is people, young and old, to get up with the skills they have, be they great or small, knowledge they have, be it deep or shallow. Just go and tell somebody how good God is to you, folk. We got to do it. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this planet. Time is short. We got no time arguing with each other over jewelry and stuff like that. No, I, I don't know whether somebody's going to be saved with jewelry or not. I don't, my wife didn't wear it. Most women I see wearing don't look no better than they did before they wore it. <laughs> see, when, you, when you're old, you can just say stuff in the pulpit. And they just say, well, the Negro's old, just let him know. We'll pray for him. <laughs> Debating about whether we should go to bowling alleys and things. I mean, that's foolishness, folks. There's people dying out there. They're drug addicts and they're crooks. They don't care about this other stuff. We got to be ready to, 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 to receive everybody. The person who's not sure about the sexual orientation, you got to receive them. They see, see that, 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 that wasn't as loud as amen. They, <laughs> that was that was that was more subdued. Amen. They kind of said, uh, "Amen." What I'm telling you is this: in this day and time. We can't make decisions for God about who's going to be saved. Tell them. Tell them. Go tell them. Let the Spirit of God do its work. John. John's version. John's version. <laughs> oh, well. The old man's doing all right. I'm doing all right. John, John's version. Believe it or not, I'm almost done. No, no, I don't, I don't see no need in preaching until the saints fall over sleep. Get up, stay up, shut up. <laughs> now, John 21 gives me my fourth thing that may keep you from going as you are. Listen carefully. This is serious. This affects everybody here who owns stuff. John 21, 3. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now you got to get to Peter. He keeps showing up. Poor fella. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. People have come to the door where the apostles are hiding, Elder, and they said, he's up, we've seen him. You would think the response would be great zeal and joy. Ready to go, Easton, they're ready now because he's up. Peter says, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going fishing. Now, he called him from that three and a half years ago. Are you hearing me? See, one of the things you got to watch as you go through life is if you get comfortable, if things in the church and with God don't go the way you expected, my brother, and life starts kicking you in the face every day, you can decide it's not worth hanging in. I'm going fishing. But he called you from fishing. He called you from the other life. 
He called you from the self-centered existence. He called you from that. And though he has acted in a way you were not expecting, that was the case with Jesus and Peter. He thought Jesus was going to come down off the cross, make great pronouncements, send down lightning bolts, kill all the Romans. Jesus died for that rascal's sin. And Peter now is not sure what to do. So he's with the disciples and notice, notice his influence. I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going also. <laughs> Ain't nobody got no backbone. Is there no one? These are the, these are the remaining apostles. Y'all listen to this preacher. So you've come from here and there, this island, that island, come to the United States, come successful. You got this and that, houses and all kind of stuff, cars. I looked at, I looked, I looked at the parking lot because the elder brought me in. <laughs> all this money out there on four wheels, listen to the preacher. You see, you see, the last one is life distraction. Doubts kept them from going. Hard heartedness kept them from going. Just plain old ignorance kept them from going. But the big thing that Satan uses to keep us from going is the use of life. There's just stuff. We got all kinds of stuff. You know, it's no accident that in Revelation 13, the Bible says that that great power is going to keep us from buying and selling. Why would the Lord use that test on God's people? Because we always buying and selling. He can't trick us with tobacco. We gave that up. Can't trick us with drugs. We're scared of getting caught and thrown in jail. Can't, 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 can't keep us from liquor because we know we, that'll make us act like we have no sense. So, so instead, Satan has got God's people so locked down with responsibilities and debts and things and stuff. That's why he's going to burn it all up. I'm in the union office. Just moved up from Ohio. Big shot now in the union office. <laughs> Lord going to burn that union office up too. <laughs> and I come up to the stoplight, Elder. Come up to the stoplight. Got my little Pontiac. But I've had the Pontiac a long time, Elder. Windshield wiper don't work on the driver's side. <laughs> Power windows don't work, you know, so forth and so on. And up beside me drives this guy in this Mercedes, XLV 450-9999-ZZZ. You know, the more letters, the more we want to own, see? And it's hot. It's August. It's August in the D.C. area. It's hot as Hades. And, and the brother's sitting there. He's got his you know, shirt and tie. I got on my shirt and tie, but I'm sweating because the air conditioning don't work. So we come up to the light, and he's sitting there all cool. I need <laughs> to roll my windows down. <laughs> but I don't want this dude in this 450 XXXJJJ to know that this old Pontiac ain't got no air conditioning. So I'm sitting there at the light, sweating like a pig, tie on, you know, and I'm praying, Lord, you got to change this light from red to green or a dumb preacher's gonna die on the highway on the way to work. 
Holy Spirit whispered to me, don't worry. I'm going to burn that Mercedes up. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Peter, three times, do you love me more than your stuff, more than your old life, more than the things of this world? Do you love me? Because I need you to go as you are, poor, broke, can't pay the rent. Sears closed. Sears is closing up. Uh, J.C. Penney closed. <laughs> are you listening to me? I need you to go as you are. Why? Because time is short. Got no time for people tied to stuff. I'm going to burn up. Let it loose. Go tell somebody there's a mansion upstairs. Go tell somebody going to give you a robe that needs no dry cleaning. Go tell somebody I got a place for you on hallelujah street go tell somebody I got a tree for the healing of the nation go tell somebody go as you are Ask me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. The theme is clear. Thank you, Elder. We will go. Will you go? As you are? Well, there's a twist in my sermon. The Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from the earth, but the Holy Spirit is filling his church. I want to be filled with the power to go to this crazy world. What do you say? Sing the chorus, Savior, Savior. Yes, 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 yes. And so, I think the message is clear and plain. I want to go. Brother, I, I'm 80 years old, but I still am willing to go. Will you join me? Come on, stand on your feet. Stand on your feet.